So why are they changing? Let's talk about that. Density, rate of growth, is this why they're changing? A lot of your strength in southern yellow pine comes from the, the summer wood bands or the, what's called the late wood bands. That's all the, uh, the layers that your trees are putting, them on, putting on in the summer and winter when that's, the growth slows significantly and you get the darker portion of the, of the tree, of the growth rings. Um, you can see in these slides some of the different rates that I've got up there. Uh, the ones on y'all's left is, are probably close to being considered dense, although they're real close to it. The definition of dense lumber when it comes to grade rules is a minimum of six rings per inch. You can actually have four rings per inch if you have 50% summer wood. So that just goes to, sh that's in the, in the grade rules. So that goes to show you what the, the summer wood does to the strength of lumber. One of the things that I've heard somebody mention, and I don't know if this is true or not, but when it comes to the density, uh, anecdotally I've heard that in the first go round back in the 90s when we had our first set of design values, uh, you were seeing a lot less plantation grown material. You were seeing about 70% of the material that came through that was tested was actually dense. About 30 of it was considered coarse. Not necessarily non-dense, but just, um, just coarse. Now, uh, in the test that we've done, it's looking more like we were testing, a, uh, present day, that we're testing about 30%. It's about flip-flopped. 30% of the material was dense. About 70% of the material was coarse. Uh, there are going to be some uh, uh, foresters talking later, and I'll let them talk about the conclusions you can draw from that. Juvenile wood. Um, I hear anecdotally again that uh, juvenile wood comes a lot more from plantation grown material. Juvenile wood is the, the spongier material that stays in or that grows early on in the life cycle of the tree. Uh, you're going to see that more in plantation grown material because it obviously can grow so much faster. Uh, juvenile wood is known to be less stable and weaker than non juvenile wood, the, the wood fibers that are put on later in the growing in the life of the tree. You can see some of these pieces. These are some of the actual pieces that we tested. I went down to our lab and took some pictures of these. Um, look at the, the range in these. Your top two pieces there, pretty good looking pieces uh, as far as distribution of the summer wood bands. Um, then go down to that middle piece right there. Uh, of course, the, the pink part there, that's just the heart. Um, and it, there's no significant structural difference that we've seen in our testing between heartwood and sapwood. Um, it really comes down to the density in those portions. But the juvenile wood, um, I don't have the pointer, but it's probably about a good uh, half of that piece is juvenile wood. You can just see the large growth rings that it really put on. Juvenile wood, not just a strength issue, but it's also a stability issue. Guarantee you, if I get a call from somebody about a, a complaint with decking, um, it's because that decking was laid down, it had a lot of juvenile wood in it, and that piece will shrink uh, a good half inch sometimes in length. Uh, which is a very large factor. You wouldn't expect to see that much shrinkage in length at all when it comes to lumber. Um, the piece at the very bottom I wanted to talk about as well. It's got some pretty good growth ring bands on that towards the outer portion. Got a little bit of juvenile wood around the, the heart center there, probably for the first two, three, four, about five years or so, probably when that thing was shooting up in a plantation. So I put a question mark after the juvenile wood. Is that the actual reason why? I don't know. I don't know if anybody has the true answer but you can take your own conclusions away from that. Let's talk about other species. What is Southern Yellow Pine competing against? SPF. Uh, the Forest Products Lab has reviewed the test data from 2000 to 2008 and found no downward trends in the MOE or the MOR. That's the bending and the stiffness. Uh, there is further testing that's going to be performed. Uh, should be done by the end of 2012. Doug further, I've got an update uh, uh, on Doug Fur, the testing's complete and they haven't published the results. I have seen an initial uh, set of data come back for the Doug Fur. It looks like it actually has a 1% increase uh, in the design values. So that's not published yet, but uh, that's what it looks like. So if it's just 1%, they probably won't change anything, but it's just interesting to see Doug Fur compared to Southern Yellow Pine. Why? I don't know. I'm not a, uh, a professional forester. Um, SPFS is still in the testing process, probably be complete early in 2013, and HEMFER, we haven't seen any results back yet. Just a graph, everybody loves graphs. You can look at these instead of me, so it's great. Um, you can see the, the blue and the red on your left. That's Southern Yellow Pine bending over on the left side, pre-June 2012. The red is post-June uh, 2012, and you can look at the other species that I've lifted uh, listed in there in case you can't read those. 
you got Doug Fur, S, him for S, that means domestic or southern. Um, SPF Canadian and SPFS, which is domestic SPF. So that's a, a pretty interesting slide to look at when you compare. On the right side, those bars are for the MOE, the stiffness values. Impact on the markets. What is this going to do to the southern yellow, parket, southern yellow pine markets? Uh, trust manufacturers, uh, they're, they're really worried about this, and I don't blame them because they are taking southern yellow pine, they're taking your trees, buying it from the sawmills, and they have to actually make an engineered product. And if that product fails, you know who's going to be on the hook for that. Uh, glue land manufacturers, they're worried about design values. Uh, multifamily housing projects and multi-story commercial projects as well. This is all very interesting to them because they're the ones that have the engineered drawings on the line. Now, your average single family dwelling, it's probably, a, you know, an architect has drawn something up on that, but it's going to be based off your standard 16 inches on center, typical load patterns as long as it's not over two and a half stories. Um, not, not as deeply engineered as some of these other projects. Treating industry, though, I don't think that's going to be affected near as much as uh, what we'll see in those first four bullet points there. And if you think about it, the, when's the last time uh, you saw a deck that was engineered? Um, I know when I built that bouncy deck on the back of my house, it is bouncy. Um, I didn't have an engineer draw that up. I had to write it down on a napkin and give it to my local building code department, and that's all I had to do. Um, so I just don't see the treating industry, and most of the anecdotal feedback that I get from people when we talk about this is they don't see this as uh, near as affecting the treating industry either. What could this mean for the Southern Yellow Pine applications? Uh, lower design values would give you shorter span capabilities. Uh, it would require higher visual grades to achieve the old spans that you had. Uh, you may have to go to a wider width. If a 2 by 8 number 2 used to span this for a living room, now you may need a 2 by 10 uh, the MSR and MEL grades we're going to get into as well. That's machine stress rated or machine evaluated lumber. This is a, an alternative method to grade your lumber. Some other alternatives. Um, you know, we don't want to hear it, but it might cause folks to go to a different species. It might cause people to look at steel or concrete. Probably not for a house, but for somewhere where they're using southern yellow pine. All right, visual grading versus machine grading. Both of these systems, and the machine grading is that MSR and the MEL that I was talking about. Both of these systems evaluate the strength reducing characteristics. When I visually grade something at a sawmill, I'm looking at that piece, I'm looking at the knots, and I'm trying to calculate in my head as I flip it over, what's the general cross section that is being removed by that knot, because anywhere you have a knot, that's a weak spot in the board. The more knot, the weaker the piece. And there are tricks and trades of doing this, and you've got to practice it a bunch to be able to do it with any kind of speed. Uh, but it's, it's doable. It's a method that's been around for forever. Um, the machine grading, though, this is something that uh, hadn't been around quite as long. Um, the, main, the first systems that came out for machine grading use flat-wise bending E, uh, where they take it right behind the, the planer. The lumber comes out of the back of the planer. They put it through a set of, of rolls up and down on the flat-wise surface, and they get a flat-wise E that they then correlate <coughs> to a, a bending, an F sub B as well. Here's the math that we were talking about earlier. So the, you use that correlation along with your offline daily testing to prove that that material truly does meet a certain design value. There are visual overrides that you use for those grades as well for usability purposes such as wane, that rounded edge of the lumber from the bark. We're still waiting for everybody to start growing square trees out there. Um, but um, I didn't get near the laugh I was hoping for. Um, but it allows you to get a higher yield using machine graded lumber and it also allows you to provide your customer a little better assurance that this material will actually meet these particular design values as published. 